thanks for coming. So, uh, welcome to Videology. Um, for some of you guys that haven't been here, we're glad to have you. Um, we wanted to welcome you, welcome you to an installment of uh, what we call our Knowledge Lab series. So, really what we like to do is get to everybody together, um, really, and just have sort of like an, an intimate and sort of candid conversation about things that affect our industry. So, uh, we've done other ones in the past around viewability. We've done bots. Uh, we have one coming in this. We, don't, we didn't do bots. We, we were against them. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, connected television also come in the summer. Um, and then of course today is header bidding. So header bidding for video, um, just sort of industry uh, buzz, discussion, just love to sort of have an open and candid conversation. So through the day, um, please just, um, we wanna make this interactive. There'll be times for questions really kind of later, but certainly any thoughts or um, things we wanna talk about, we're certainly open to. There's really two parts to today. So we're gonna start with a presentation, Jeff Ellen, who's gonna uh, kick us off with um, just sort of an overview of what video header bidding is, uh, and then we're going to do a panel. So we have some panelists here, and we'll certainly talk a little bit more about that. Um, certainly open for questions, and, and um, anything will go from there. So without further ado, we'll bring up Jeff. So Jeff is our um, Senior Vice President of Global Commercial Product Strategy, and he's going to talk a little bit more about some of the technical elements around uh, video header bidding, and we'll kick it off from there. So here's Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks, John. and. Uh Thanks to the panelists who will be up here shortly to kick off the discussion. Um, before we begin by you know, kicking off with a little bit of a background on header bidding in general and how it relates to you know, video header bidding. So this definition, although header bidding in general tends to be a little bit technical and operational in the, in the weeds when it comes to the implementation, um, at, at its core what it does is it allows you know, publishers to have multiple demand partners compete for impressions simultaneously with the goal of driving yield. Um, uh, it ended up being, uh, you know, something that was created as a way to uh, bypass in the display world originally, I would say, uh, DFP preference, I guess, for um, addicts within the dynamic allocation engine. So, you know, how does it work? So, on your left is, a version of a traditional waterfall. I think most of you guys are probably familiar with this. You might have your publisher direct deals, didn't clear there, might go down to preferred deals, then go to private auctions, and then the open exchange. And as you kind of work down that way, time increases, um, but value also decreases as the value tends to be higher when you're, you're at the top of it. Um, so what, what header bidding allowed was to kind of even the playing field, allowed maybe you know, a buyer down at the bottom who might be willing to pay more for that impression at that time to compete with and win over that particular, you know, publisher uh, direct deal. Um, tend, you know, coming from display, it tends to be, you know, more supply than demand and then having the liquidity of extra buyers within the process allowed, uh, you know, for greater yield for publishers as well. Um, header bidding, more to the right originally, I guess, was, was more, uh, like, as I mentioned, more technical, more operational. And there was code the buyers could put within the page header, which allowed them to, before the ad server call was made, see information about the audience, understand, uh, provide a price they'd be willing to pay for it, and at that time kind of leveled the playing field for, to compete with the other, you know, um, opportunities within, that we saw in the, the, the waterfall itself. Um, originally, like I said, it was more actually in the header, it's kind of transitioned a lot more to be more of a server-side implementation as the um, concerns around increased latency due to the, the, the tags being put in the header. Um, that also kind of limited the amount of buyers that could participate just from a sheer latency perspective. Um, so a lot of this act, it happens now within the server-side, but uh, there's also some drawbacks there. There might be uh, a loss of cookie matching, therefore audiences may not be found as easily as they would have been in the past when they were in the header. Um, so, you know, with the success that happened with in display, um, naturally publishers were, hey, I would like to extend this to, or understand more about how this could work for me with my video inventory. Um, so again, the, the, the traditional waterfall approach existed within the, the video world. Um, on, the, on the video side though, from implementing, it is, it is a little bit different. There's the introduction of a player, which kind of adds to the tech stack of things that needs to be incorporated in this process. And it, it, you know, for, for, for my experiences, it tends to be less about the page header and more about the server side. Um, 
initially. So it's not really technically header bidding in the way that it was defined originally. It's kind of just used as a you know way of describing this process. Although you know um, it is a little bit different from when it comes to the actual naming convention. So um, when it comes to to the the video, obviously um, header bidding provides uh, an opportunity for publishers to make more money, but there is challenges, and I think a lot of the, some of those challenges end up being exacerbated when it comes to um, video itself. Um, so video depends on the type of inventory it is. So if you're thinking about more traditionally full episode player where video came with pre-rolls, mid-rolls, or pre-rolls before short form, there, it tends to be a little more uh, scarce. And so the demand is kind of already, is, is already there. The demand outstrips the supply. And so, you know, the liquidity is not necessarily something that's necessarily needed, um, although nice, but, um, and there's also some additional challenges that come along with it, especially with AdPod inventory, where things such as Clash come into consideration. Um, the amount of callouts that might happen to uh, the DSPs might increase significantly just because of, um, there could be multiple calls for each AdPod slot within the, the AdPod itself. Um, and there needs to be more of a brand control aspect from the, the publishers themselves. And uh, also just always a concern around um, data leakage when it comes to publishers making sure that buyers aren't gaining too much information and then using that with, with their other buyers. Um, the other than the spectrum, there's been um, an increase, obviously, in I would, I would call it more display-like video inventory. So outstream slash in read, whatever you want to call it, or maybe interstitial videos that are, you know, not necessarily uh, before an actual, you know, full episode player or short form piece of content. And the demand there might, um, or the, the, the inventory and supply there might be a little bit uh, more like display where not, not quite as scarce. So, and you don't have things like clash that come into consideration. So um, there's a, a difference also maybe at times with the, the sales force. And you know, doing direct deals um, with with advertisers and uh, brands directly versus um, tending tending to to play in the programmatic field uh, more initially. So, I would I would kind of look at the two types of inventory within video as being um, uh, different in nature enough that uh, the solutions of header bidding might apply to one more than it might apply to the to the other. Um, and then you know. His header bidding right for you. So I think we probably all agree that taking a holistic approach to your demand um, you know, will maximize and improve your yield. Um, but how to implement a strategy to you know, increase your yield obviously depends on you and your particular needs, how you sell, the type of inventory that you have. And so you know, I think it's, it starts with just making sure you ask the right questions. What is my ultimate goal? Um, is there other approaches that can even help um, increase my yield as well. My, my, do I have first party data um, that is valuable, that scores well against DARS, or a way for me to package that up and off, offer it uh, like as programmatic guaranteed to meet a buyer's you know, needs? Um, you can increase yield that way. Um, uh, other, you know, is there other data driven strategies? Do I have a high completion percentage rate? Do, you know, do I want to package up inventory that way and sell it and increase my yield that way if I'm scarce, if I have scarce inventory? Or do I have a small sales force and I can't go out and meet all these things? This, this is an approach that can work for me. So um, ultimately, it's about you know also understanding what is your ultimate strategy across all your inventory sources. You know, do you have OTT inventory? Do you have mobile inventory? Do you want to utilize set top box VOD? Will this strategy work across all of them? Um, you know, it has challenges in that regards also. So um, at the at the end of the day, I guess. It's maybe let's not focus on the, the buzzword itself, understand what the solution is that's being provided and understand if it can work for you and if there's other ways of you know, making that happen, so. Cool. That's it, thanks Jeff. Yeah. I'm just gonna use this mic, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it reminds me more of like a karaoke kind of thing. Um, I should have introduced myself as we do this. I, I'm, uh, I'm John Rogers, so I oversee um, our media partnerships um, programmatic packaging here for Videology. Uh, I should have done that before I kicked it off, although it would have been weird for some random dude from Times Square to come up and do this. But um, header bidding, of course, is taking over the world. 
So anyway, um, why don't we bring up our panelists also? Um, and just to kind of set the stage too, so you have video views coming up. I think I'm gonna sit here and then you guys. Does it matter which way we go? Oh yeah, they wanted us to sit in the order of the, so. that's gonna be the hardest part of the day. Um, I'll go off to the side. So you have video views going up. You have uh, technology from display in place that has driven yield for um, publishers. And then of course you have the need to drive yield um, all the time for publishers. So of course video header bidding or at least header bidding for video or the concept of that is sort of rise um, to the top for, for discussion and for interest. Um, so anyway, we thought it'd be a good idea for our panelists to kind of kick in and have a little bit of a conversation here. Uh, we'll start with a few questions on our end and then at the end we certainly can take questions from you guys and then questions for Jeff as well. Um, we'll go from there. So uh, if you guys don't mind, maybe we'll just start. If you can introduce yourself and we'll start with Brian right here and um, what you do and what your company and everything. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Brian Weiser from Pivotal Research. I am a sell-side analyst, meaning I cover a bunch of stocks related to the um, advertising industry in particular. And if it sounds like, well, I, I think I'm probably the least qualified person uh, probably in this room to talk about this topic. Uh, if I sound like I know anything relative to most analysts, it's because I did spend eight years at uh, the Vinter Public and another year at Simul Media. Great, Dave? Good morning, I'm Dave Jacobs. I'm Chief Operating Officer at 33 Across. 33 Across provides a monetization analytics platform for publishers. Uh, our monetization platform focuses on a suite of highly viewable um, ad units uh, across both display and video. So we're not a video-only company, but we conduct a simultaneous option across multiple um, ad experiences. Morning, Dan Callahan, uh, Vice President of Programmatic and Data-Driven Sales at Fox Networks Group. Uh, that includes Fox Sports, Fox FX, National Geographic, a lot of the long-form stuff that Jeff was talking about. Thanks for having me. Scott Braley, I'm GM of Advertising Platforms for Uyala. Um, Uyala, more broadly, is a video platform comprised of a video player, so we do have that piece in the arsenal, as well as a media logistics company. We do a lot of custom workflow integration for back-end uh, systems integrations and things like that for broadcasters. I oversee the global advertising business, which is comprised of a video ad server and programmatic platform. Great. And thanks for coming, guys. We really appreciate you being here. Um, maybe just to, to start it off at sort of a high level, Brian, if you don't mind, um, Maybe give us your perception or, or your overall kind of definition as to what header bidding a video kind of looks like. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I could outdo the definition. Jeff one. Yeah, that, that was much more detailed. And, and frankly, like I say, I'm probably the least qualified person in the room to talk about it, which might be useful in the sense of how I oversimplify what I think it is. Yeah. It's yield optimization. And when I think of it simply in those terms, I mean, I saw this, you know, when I showed up, um, at IPG, uh, I was a banker and analyst before that, and I was wondering, like, why again do we pay a different price for uh, inventory at prime time versus inventory at daytime, even if there was identical rating, let's just say, for a given program? Like, explain that to me. And, you know, there was rationale behind it and history and all that, but it, there was obviously a monetization improvement opportunity, which you know, yield optimization that could follow from it if there was a compelling reason as to why the other inventory could be proven to be more valuable in traditional TV. And obviously in digital, this has played out more uh, on a more widespread basis in display for starters. And now with video, my observation has been, and I suspect most of you in this room will have experienced, um, the opportunity is less obvious or less immediate than it would have been in display. But it's, you know, going from a penny for, for a thousand impressions to ten dollars is obviously wider than going from five dollars to ten, but it's still a lot of absolute improvement to be realized. And so I, yeah, I just see it as ways to improve the yield on any given impression. Got it. Thanks, Dave. What are your thoughts on that? Um, just from your perspective, do you, do you not agree or disagree? But generally, how do you feel? Disagree. About disagree. That? Yeah, fight, fight. It's too early for that. I, look, all the header bidding ever did is increase competition, right? So. We went for this sort of, let's optimize a bunch of ad networks, let's waterfile a bunch of SSPs to, you know, try to make something a little more efficient. And it was a big pain point for publishers because everything's moving quickly on mobile, you're going down on mobile, so it's very attractive um, for, for companies to be able to display. I think video is very interesting right now because the consumption of video is taking on a lot of different forms. As Jeff described, there's different camps of supply pools, and uh, in some cases there's a lot of constraints in supply, and in some, some cases there's not. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Yep, absolutely. Dan, how about from a from a your Fox perspective? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's challenging. I mean, I like the idea of header bidding. Competition and programmatic has always driven higher yield results. But um, you know, where we're looking at our video inventory, there are constraints. It is those prime time programs that are being consumed in an on demand fashion. So regardless if it's a daytime show or a prime time show, that person is creating their own personal prime time moment to consume the program that they want to watch. Um, you know, besides the challenges around ad insertion and competitive separation in FEP. I just think that there's so many other decisions maybe outside of four or five business rules that we need to think of when there's somebody who purchases a program on linear, bringing that money to digital, um, you know, giving somebody who maybe has a historically lower CPM an advantage that, you know, header bidding doesn't necessarily think of and there needs to be that human element to, to manage the yield properly on our side. Got it. That's helpful and interesting. How about at Uyala? Scott? Yeah, I would, I would typically agree with, um, you know, most of our constituents, most of our customers are broadcasters, similar to Dan. And so we, we don't really come across header bidding as a viable thing for our customers. Um, we do come across it as a conversation they all want to have because they hear the latest buzzword like anything else. And yeah. they want to understand what, I mean, when people talk about video, the first thing we typically are saying is, look, what, what do you mean by video? Video ads or video content? Is it monetizing the video assets that you've got or just throwing video ads in a bunch of you know, linear pages because you want to make more money? Um, so I guess we kind of come at it from an academic standpoint as a little bit of a contrarian. Um, you know, the fundamental premise of why it exists is kind of eroding a little bit as far as its initial incarnation. So I just think it, it leads to a more thoughtful, interesting conversation. But in our, in our world specifically, it doesn't really have a ton of relevance. Got it. So you're managing more um, sort of over, or at least guiding your clients mostly on overall yield, yield management, that type of yes, thing. Yes, but we're also thinking about it more broadly and holistically around um, what's the ideal ad load for assets and how does that change by device and over time. We have a lot of customers that have a lot of connected TV inventory, which is another whole set of you know worms um, or can of worms. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's we, we're, we're, we're very much thinking about the broader advice around how do you package price and promote inventory across any monetization, uh, direct sold or programmatically. And some of the stuff we've been building is connecting a lot of the, 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 the uh, programmatic connections directly within our ad server so that you're not circumventing and jumping ahead of the ad server, you're empowering the ad server. And you're uh, giving the user, the broadcaster, complete configurability around which deals and marketplaces ought to compete dynamically in real time with all of the direct book campaigns with a lot more control over the array of business rules that you might apply, not just the few that would be in a header bidding solution. Got it. Um, so Dan at Fox, is that similar to the approach then? So it's not necessarily header bidding as a, as a tactic, but more around overall kind of yield management? Yeah, I just think that we, you know, employ a big team of people that helps do sponsorships. Um, you know, current seasons of Empire are, are certainly more valuable than there's so many different business rules that make sense and would trump one versus just, hey, you know, is a campaign pacing to deliver in full and can we potentially get a higher CPM from somebody we do not have a significant business relationship with, right? So for an agency or an advertiser that, you know, commits hundreds of millions of dollars in the upfront, they're going to be treated differently every time than, you know, JetBlue who found a cookie for somebody looking to plan a flight and they want to go first at that particular moment in time. Can I throw an interesting distinction that is, I'm thinking about it? You know, again, another, what to me was a bizarre anomaly when it showed up in the agency world was, so let me get this straight, the same unit of inventory is available at a radically different price depending on who you are, your history, your, and the cost space concept. And I'm not sure if a lot, this may be something where a lot of folks in the digital world may not fully appreciate this, that the gaps are wide. And you could be a Sony, I'm just making it up, but Sony could have a $40 CPM, whereas a Procter & Gamble for the same inventory might have a $20 CPM, or some kind of gap like that which creates an interesting difference, would you agree, with when it comes to how you think about yield optimization for, let's call it, premium or traditional TV-based content in a digital environment, because it's not like in digital where maybe there's an established baseline price for a digital video buyer, where it's just a $10 CPM, or the range is narrower. Do you agree that it's a difference in the I agree. That issue? Definitely yeah. a difference in the thought process around, uh. you know, who is your most important customer, right? Or, or how do we prioritize things appropriately? Um, you know, selling display at, at Fox News in my past life certainly was a big fan of dynamic allocation. Header bidding, I think, makes sense in display. I thought Jeff's comparison to some of the video units outstream, even pre-roll, or, or these, you know, things that pop up on your screen when they pause, right? It, it kind of creates this influx of impressions that we're calling video, but
but but are they really video? Can we define mm -hmm. them that way? And um, you know, we I think you know our new president of sales, Joe, made a great point at our upfront that there's an emerging flux of this subprime video, and that if we just continue to add video and add you know decisioning engines to yield optimized video units that are not in front of content or in in, in a mid roll break of an FTP then we're creating this subprime market crisis where we're all going to you know, have trouble in the future by you know, short-sighting this now and, and, and short-playing it. So, It's interesting. And David, 33 Cross, you guys are sort of looking at both display and video. So how, what's your approach there or sort of ad, you know, as it relates to header bidding just in general? Or? Yeah, sure. Our, our, our approach is a bit, uh, a bit unique. And Dan, we probably fall into that second category, right, of, of subprime. To a certain extent, because there's not content behind the video unit. But what we do have is we have a highly engaged audience that are watching the ads. They're not clicking, uh, you know, they're not closing out of those ads. And there's uh, appropriate price discovery tools that are allowing buyers to find those audiences and find finding that kind of user environment at the appropriate price, right? So, um, price discovery and uh, all the business rules that you're describing are incredibly important for a, a very narrow set of publishers. In the industry today, the traditional broadcasters, etc. But there are thousands and thousands of publishers in the Facebook sort of you know news sharing world that are not going to be doing upfronts. They're not going to be building their own sales organizations at scale. And uh, the question for them is how how can they leverage and, and maximize the opportunity of people who are shifting their you know, user time to a digital environment? And there are many ways to do that. We're providing one of them. But uh, for sure, somebody at uh, at certain, at a lot of the publishers today that are focused on, uh, you know, creating very kind of shareable content on uh, on a social site, they don't have to deal with many of the, the very relevant issues that you know Scott and Dan are mentioning. That's interesting. Yeah, just I think both approaches, right? Because and especially in the in our space, there's um, there's room for all of it because there's still a need for scale and it's got to be quality scale, but then also the content that's behind it. So it is an interesting. Um, problem that we're trying to solve. I guess to take a step back at least a little bit, like how do we get here? So um, in display, it, the technology seems to just sort of take off almost overnight, right? So like from your experiences, and maybe Dave, we'll start with you real quick, the, the, um, in the display world, so how do, what were the benefits immediately for publishers? Was it just competition, not just, but was it competition driving yield straight up? Is that sort of where it came from? Yeah, and I, before my current role, I was over at AOL and uh, working on the publisher platform side of the business. And I think there are a couple of things. One, um, it, the, the, the barriers entered are really low, right? So for a publisher to implement header bidding, this wasn't new tech. This was tech that just kind of was on a shelf and people decided to use it and, and the word got out. So barriers entered were really low and just the sort of inefficiencies on both the buy and the sell side, this is a big opportunity to exploit that, right? To drive yield. Every time somebody puts another partner in the header for the last year, they get more revenue, right? So now we have Publishers in display that have 14, 15 people in the header. I didn't know there were 14 or 15 header bidding partners out there. Yeah, right. There are. Um, but what you're starting to see now is a bit of a reversion back, right? Because mm. buyers can't handle the TPS load. So there's a little bit of that going on. Um, but at the same time, it's 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 worked really well. And it was really, there were a lot of incentives, especially unless you're at the very top of the waterfall, to, to embrace header bidding. And there were only a couple of people that you know were, were in a position to lose, and everybody else stood, stood to gain in the space. Yeah, that's interesting. That So, um, is the approach, and Brian, do you see an, a different an approach for display and then video, or is it just sort of all kind of wrapped together? I guess it, there's a certain well, difference, the right? I see the concepts similar, but I, I see the, 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 the imperatives uh, to doing it are just different. I mean, and it's not that, the, again, we can see it in TV, we can see it in premium video, where there, there's clearly differences in what one advertiser is willing to pay versus another. Um, are there... Uh, what, even if there's not a biddable environment, is there uh, is it a tactic to improve yield? Yes. Is it as significant as display? Is it as easy given the cost to implement, given the operational changes that might follow from it? It's not as immediately compelling, which doesn't mean there's no for the long run. Um, I, I, by the way, I do. It does occur to me. Um, you know, you, you throw up that um, if you're at the top of the waterfall, maybe you don't like it so much. Uh, I mean, it makes me wonder, like. You know what does an Amazon? Um, you know how, how did the Amazons and Curtaos, which, which I think, um, you know, they, they weren't playing in this, in this space in the same way that Google was, in that they they were just buying ahead of the time and they were doing this on their own uh, before we called it header bidding, right? Um, they were just getting that first look. Uh, I, I'm curious how anyone thinks that they're 
impacted by by this because they're kind of playing it differently than Google was. Yeah, I mean, I if, when I look at header bidding, you know, and the and the rash, why it came about, and you're looking at the the Crudio and the M A9 example. That's because they have a, an asymmetrical advantage when it comes to data. They know mo a lot more about audiences, and they can. And that gets back to your point about wondering why the inventory was priced so differently is because you're not paying for inventory, you're paying for audience. Mm. And what I know about the audience as an A9 or as a Cudio might be far broader, far more substantial than what the publisher knows about it and other buyers might know about it. So they wanted to come in and just get unique access, first look access because I can back that up with guaranteed or a, a, a sizable amount of demand that will come after it. Um, but that, at the end of the day, doesn't get back to the point that the publisher has a disadvantageous position around the data, the data position, which, as the as the uh, currency of the future or some, you know, the important element of what a media dollar gets allocated towards is it the inventory, is it the device, is it the audience? It's more and more, the audience is a big component of the valuation of any moment in time ad opportunity. So if publishers aren't trying to figure out ways to get regain that. They're just going to keep losing to Facebook and Google all day long, and I just think it's a self—it's a self-evident future that they're less relevant and they're—they're they're not going to create as much value. There's no brand equity on the publisher side in the minds of buyers. So you know, if I'm thinking of building a brand and trying to be a relevant media property in the long term, you know, you want to be building that 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 audience position. Are you seeing many tool sets, Scott, out there that are able to provide sort of that? demand side power into the supply sides, um, you know, quiver? It's less, I think, a tool set as yeah. it is potentially a structural change in the mm -hmm. ecosystem between broadcasters and telcos and mm -hmm. operators and MVPDs. So there's, there's an opportunity for the operator community to leverage their audience assets better yeah. and in partnership with the broadcasters who have the great content, the engaged fandom of the user the telcos sure as hell don't have that, but they have the audience data, and so together there's a, a really interesting counterweight to a Facebook or a Google, um, and I think that's where the new solutions will come will be born out of. Got it. That's interesting. And then, so Dan, on um, just sort of in a general sense, like premium versus, um, you know, what you well your approach clearly is going to be around premium content. Is there um, is there a play in here anywhere, or just is it all really about? Um, just engaging and extracting that value. Like, do you guys have the data, the things that Scott's talking about that you're able to sort of leverage? Yes, I mean, we're working on collecting the data, partnering better with the distribution uh, distribution partners that we're you know syndicated on, whether that's Hulu, Roku on the digital side, even some of the MVPDs on the linear side. Um, you know, strengthening those partnerships, kind of owning, you know, I guess our decisioning process in that versus allowing some other third party to make those decisions for us. Um, you know, look, I think that data is going to play a big part of it in the future, but the publishers need to own that in order to try to control their own destiny. Um, and, you know, we're looking on building device graphs, OTT, right, being a very interesting piece of, of our growth. 60% of our digital consumption now happens on OTT. So, um, you know, not looking at it from a cookie or an IDFA, you know, standpoint anymore. And, you know, owning those deal IDs uh, with our premium partners to, to pilot them for ourselves. Got it. That's interesting. And then, so... Just, uh, just what about demand in general? So we did a survey and and of our demand side clients, and there was I think it was about twenty five percent really understood about header bidding at least in general, and and sort of from a demand side. Like, does the money care specifically about this? Like, how does the how does the money flow? Maybe Brian, we'll start with you and go right down the I, line. I honestly don't think it does. Yeah. Um, I I think until it, um, it obviously matters, but it, I I. I, I this is true when it comes to like whether it's TV ratings, digital prices, or whatever. Supply does not generate demand for the most part. At least when we're talking about businesses which are not um, performance driven, and, the, and I would I would think it's safe to say that the vast majority of even digital video, let alone TV, certainly budgets are not driven by the performance like metrics that we've seen in display. So whereas I could actually see how header bidding in a display-centric environment could actually contribute to more supply because opportunities for improved performance are there. If you're the mesothelioma lawyer, <laughs> finding more display inventory probably does generate more demand, right? Um, because it's hard. $2,000 CPM. Exactly. Hard to find. And it, header bidding is a wonderful solution for that 
demand source. Right. Um, but other than that very uh, specific kind of like uh, uh, um, um, uh, performance oriented source of demand, the budgets don't change. They just get reallocated when the pricing changes. That's my observation. Dave? Yeah. Well, I think the, the buyers um, are a little confused. Right? Because there's a lot of moving parts right now. So a lot of times they're trying to go to the path of least resistance. And there's a lot of near-term versus long-term considerations that aren't always being solved for in real time. Right? So they're trying to solve a, a, a threatened founding problem. And a lot of the things that are happening around them now, you know, potential implications for what do we do the next year, two, three years out, um, in terms of how they, the buy side builds sort of their own tools to sort of adjust the way content's being consumed. Um, and, and users are, are kind of consuming content online, um, both reading it in both in terms of display, but also display and, uh, and watching long form content. Uh, I would also Go comment ahead. really quickly. There, there is one element, I think, of display caring about it in the sense that they will often use it as a mechanism for circumventing the a useless SSP. Somebody mm -hmm. who's just not really creating as much value as they're extracting from that media dollar. And they want more access to DSPs, where the demand side uh, in general wants more access to premium supply, and they want undiluted access, and they want direct access and first look access. And mm -hmm. so, to the degree that it just affords them that that position, without having to go through any number of and usually multiple SSPs, they're bidding against themselves in a lot of cases. I guess that's the academic pro possibility that they're bidding against themselves, whether or not in the real world with the billions of impressions, whether they do or not. I don't know. Right, right, Dan. Well, I just think too. I mean, you can't look at. I mean, you have to look at the display world. But you know, adding two three hundred by two fifties at the bottom of the page to increase yield, we're not going to make commercial breaks longer. As a consumer, I'd go crazy. I'm sure everybody in the room hates sitting through, um, you know, a minute twenty. You know, at most right now. I mean, to add more availability there probably is not the answer. I think it's right. trying to take advantage of the data, the stuff that we own, continue to create scarcity create a better user experience using our content to drive eyeballs in a, in a larger audience and you know try to just create a, a better shorter ad experience targeted where we can um, but get people who still want to be associated with those programs based on the type of content they are um, and with the idea of a video impression in subprime right it's it's you know our opinion is that the definition of an impression is too broad right so mm -hmm. if we're you know on average a 90 percent completion rate and 90 percent viewability on FEP you know, how is that then, you know, compared to on a video line item within the agency to an outstream player that was the IAB or MRC standard? Right? You're saying Facebook's 2% viewability isn't comparable to Fox? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're implying? That's what I was trying to imply. Thank you for driving the point home for us. Right. Um, you know, Snapchat, the same thing, right? I think that there's just, it, it's too broad of a definition of what is video. And mm. I would love to, you know, not call outstream or these other video units that don't have content behind it display, but they are closer to display than they are video. Mm. And, you know, trying to educate the buying community on those differences of what you actually are buying and what to expect when you're buying, you know, X versus Y and the value associated with it. Got it. Yeah, that's really helpful, I think, too, just to sort of uh, create definition. But, Scott, with all of this um, activity, you have demand partners, you have, uh, you know, being confused, like Dave said, just sort of trying to sort it all out. You have so much action and activity. Just from a technological standpoint, like how much can the player or the ad server support like before latency and all these other things start to become a, a real problem, right? Like there's just so many decisions and the round trip of how the decisions make, like where does that kind of leave us as well? Yeah, um, well, I mean, obviously the idea of latency is a pretty powerful one and it's worse in video than it is in display. And, yeah. But I mean, again, there's all sorts of you know little workarounds that people could develop to minimize that. I think in general though, it for us in particular, and, and we kind of, stop thinking about other people at that point. I mean, it's, I'm worried about our customers and their future. So sure. for us, it's, um, we kind of, we, we break it down to what the motivations of the person is that's bringing this up. And they're gonna bring it up, they're gonna talk about it. We're gonna understand, like, why is this something that you're exploring? Like, what is the, what is the, the aspect of your business that you think this will solve? Mm. And it's a pretty easy, simple conversation to, sh to point out the flawed assumptions that typically are underpinning those questions. Right. And then, it just becomes a moot point and you move on. Again, in the you know long form video connected television broadcaster environment. Um, so, yeah. Got it, that's helpful too. So um, what advice would you guys have for publishers as, as they're sort of considering all the things that we've talked about? Um, Brian, where, 
you have a publisher in a conference room and they're just like, I'm not really sure how to play this. There's just so much action happening. What would be advice that you would have? Find someone who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean like... Invite it, somebody else to the conference room. I, yeah, invite, <laughs> hire a consultant. Uh, no, I, I mean, it, it, they know more than I do the importance of yield optimization. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how you get there. It's kind of what's the most cost-effective way to most efficiently improve your yield. I mean, that's kind of... Yep. Dave? Yeah, just start with your own objectives. Publishers are in a handful of categories we've already discussed it here today. There's a handful of really big broadcasters. There's another few dozen of, of large premiums, and then there's everybody else. And it's all a, a race to grab as much yield as possible. So you're going to have tools that are appropriate for you as a publisher, depending on what category you fall in. And I agree with Dan, not in the in the term of what's video, not, not what's not video, as much as, hey, video that served in front of pure long form content deserves a much different you know, experience and a much different rate than yield than the yield you're going to get from an outstream player, and the market's not really caught up with that yet. Um, but I, I'm expecting over time it will. Uh, completion rates are driving a lot of that, but also a lot of the upfront experiences are, are going to continue to drive that for, for the majors like Dan's company. Got it, Dan. I, I think it's a, a risk reward balance, right? It's you know, do you see a yield increase of 15, 20 percent by putting a header bidding? Probably. Um, do you lose latency, probably competitive separation on long form, uh, potential data concerns around that? You know, I think that the risks for us outweigh the potential rewards at this moment in time. Um, I could see somewhere where, uh, you know, pre-roll or something like that may make sense on certain properties if it's a run of site deal. But, um, you know, it's hard today to justify the risk that I think we'd be taking on by going all in on, on header bidding, but want to continue to, you know, stay educated and, you know, keep a finger on the pulse of what else is going on. Yep, got it. Scott? Yeah, if you were dealing with the supply that lends itself more readily to header bidding, I would just say think carefully about which partners you brought into that space because it's it's a finite space where it ought to be a finite space as far as the number of people you'd have competing. And they ought to be representing unique demand. So pulling in an SSP who's just going to pull in the same DSP connections as yet another SSP there's limited incremental value being, you know, being brought to the table. If you brought in an A9, you know, you could argue that there'd be more specific value if you're doing something like that. Got it. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, that was kind of all the questions that I have. I really do appreciate your expertise and the diversity of it up here. It was really helpful and, and hopefully interesting for the, for the group. Are there any questions from anybody out here? One of many poorly chosen labels in the industry, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I, I had sat on um, yeah. panels where the topic was programmatic, and it was sort of like very shift very quickly. You sort of shift to it's really about friction and access to demand, which here I think it's really just as much about yield management, which is what Brian opened with. We could have wrapped this up in like two seconds. But, um, <laughs> no, that's interesting. Yeah, and absolutely, Mike. I think you had a question. Yeah, um, just kind of reacting to what Scott said, which is the publisher who deserves the principal access must just be able to. On the other hand, you also if you can keep the cost very clear access, so you find the publisher to have a cost of one five, the institution is required to be the access. Header bidding exposes that data to many all the inverted buyers on every page. The average email is going up is about twenty five. So the five fifteen serving principal data access that field management is yeah. I mean, Did everybody hear that, by the way? Sorry, I should have given the mic to him. So generally around how does a premium publisher or publishers in general build what might call defensible data assets and, and how to make that, uh, uh, square that off with header bidding and increased competition where you sort of expose those data assets. Yeah, we, I actually was um, sold the Atlas business to Facebook from Microsoft. And one of their fundamental problems that they ran into was the not having thought through the data leakage concern. They had this great data asset, and they thought they'd buy a bunch of ad tech to activate the, uh, or they, you know, they, they didn't understand what the implication was of using that data in an advertising environment off property. And they bought things they didn't need to buy and kind of ran into that issue, which, you know, data leakage, if you have that data um, position and it's a, it's a very, uh, 
it's just an, it's a val high value asset. You have to understand uh, what you're trading off by an incremental CPM of 20% this month versus the long-term viability of that asset. So I couldn't agree more. Anybody else? No? Good? Good, very Sorry, good. Sorry, I couldn't very good. Chair's a little uncomfortable. But, uh, <laughs> it's held up well. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, if that's it, we do appreciate everybody coming here today. Um, hopefully it was a good way to start the day. Our whole idea here was, again, to just sort of have a um, sort of a smaller and sort of quick uh, conversation to get everybody um, uh, at least have a conversation around that uh, header bidding and, and uh, what that means for our space. So we thank everybody for coming. We thank you for your business. And um, we're certainly going to hang around for a little bit. You're welcome to, I think, have more coffee if there's any stuff back there. So again, thanks a lot for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Very nice to meet you.